Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, teacher. You see, there it is. This is for those who have missed and are not here this morning who are watching via video or whatever, so you can know that the crowds that are in here are glad to be here this morning. <laughs> well, this morning we're starting a, a new study. I had intended to... I, don't, I, don't, I think that the Lord understands us. <laughs> I think that the Holy Spirit gets our purposes. See, I, I wanted to go in a particular direction. I felt that was the Lord, and I still feel it is, <clears throat> to talk about our union in Christ. I believe that if there are two legs biblically that we stand on in order to understand and receive and walk in the good and the power of the Word of God, there are two legs that we must stand on. And one leg we've already kind of presented, and that's God's nature, who He is, the Trinity. We must have an increased understanding of the Trinity of God. It's just too valuable not to. We miss, I think, 80% of the motive and the beauty of what happens in our lives and who God is to us and how we're to relate to one another as we have a diminished understanding of the Trinity. And then second to that is our union in Christ. Because our union in Christ is God's essential way of involving us and including us and working in us the greatness of himself. That's union in Christ. And then in order to convey or get that revelation of who he is and who we are to him and who he is to us, he communicates and travels all that to us via the doctrines of grace, which we just went through. The doctrines of grace is the avenue through which the Trinity and our union in Christ will come to us as God gathers us into the reality of himself and of, into this union through the doctrines of grace. So if you would just allow me, that's how I see these things working out. And then our being born again and sanctification is now the activity of God bringing all this to bear in us. But the Holy Spirit says, no, really, I want you to teach Matthew. Hmm. So I tried to explain to the Lord that all during Bill's presentation those weeks, I'm reading and studying and taking notes and compiling information. And it, it just didn't go anywhere. So we're teaching the Gospel of Matthew. And, and I am excited because at first I thought, you know, I wanted to do that. And then it began to grow on me. No, this is where God wants us. This is where we need to be. It's a delight. It's going to be great. Not because the teacher is great, but because God is great in doing this. So, aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit is the one who is in charge of hopefully everything we teach and do and whatever. Not only as leaders, but as all of us as a company of God. Amen? Amen. So, today we're in the Gospel of Matthew and we'll be in it for, I don't know how long, I can't say that. I'd like to say so many weeks, whatever, but I've learned that that was no good. I learned my lesson when I <clears throat> had originally approached Bill Treby and said, you know, we normally take off a couple of weeks or whatever, a prayer or whatever, and then would you like to teach, you know, two or three Sundays? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How long did he teach? <laughs> I mean, I thought the man would never stop. <laughs> and then Evan comes in. And so you see, it's, it's really difficult for us to say, this is what we're going to do even when we think that the Lord has told us that and then he begins to show us, well, you just misunderstand. When I said three, uh, you probably didn't understand that word. So, first of all, thanks so much, so, so, so much to Bill for submitting to the Lord and being used by the Holy Spirit in that wonderful teaching. I am hoping that that is a mine of gold and riches for you. Uh, there was so much there. I would say get the CDs or whatever the notes and keep them and occasionally go back and review them or if there's a particular aspect of the faith that you're not clear about, get that particular teaching 
and uh, look at it and listen to it and work through it and, and see if the Lord doesn't give you greater uh, revelation. <laughs> Sorry about this. So let's, let's talk about Matthew this morning. First of all, some just general fundamental information and next week we'll go into the text. And next week we'll begin to read at least the first 17 verses of Matthew. We'll at least do that part, the genealogy, and probably proceed past that. But that is where we'll be next week for sure. So I would ask you for homework to read the genealogy. You know, who begat whom? Who, whose daddy is this? And whose mama is that? And you think, who cares? Whatever, you know, as long as... No, it's very important that we understand that and see what Matthew is doing here. So read those verses, become familiar with them, and may I say this, especially, look at the names of the four ladies. Three are mentioned directly and one is mentioned by reference. And so you have four women who are involved here. Uh, look at all of this. Just think about what are you saying to us, the Lord? What are you trying? What are you not? What are not? I said, you see, I slipped. What are you trying to communicate? I hate that. What is God communicating? God never tries anything. He's never tried anything. He ain't never going to try anything. And I... I'm sorry for other people who slip like I did. He's trying. It's, it's a misnomer. Amen? Amen? So let me just correct myself real fast. And if I say God is trying, please raise your hand and say that's not correct. Uh, please do that to me. I, I, I would need help. So before we go into the text itself, some background is necessary for better understanding. <clears throat> We're just going to give a scant background. There's a whole lot more information we can, can know about, but I don't think is needed for us at this particular time in this study. So let me just kind of go through this with us, mechanically go through it, and, and let's see what we have here. It's so important to understand background. Anytime, if you have a Bible that begins each book with a background and history and origin and author and context, you know, all of this stuff, that is a good Bible. If you don't have a Bible that does that, don't throw the Bible you have away, but buy a Bible that does that. And so every time I read one of the books of the Bible, I always go back to the background. I reread all the background. I just reread it to reacquaint myself with the history and the author and his purpose and all of that information. Why? Because I will forget things. I need to be refreshed and I need to place myself within the original context of what God is saying to his people during that particular time through that particular author so that God will speak to me personally through all of this revelation all of this background information and so every time I read a book of the Bible I go back and if you look at some of my Bibles that I've used you'll see underlining and just and say why is he so important in that this is what the Bible is saying that's a background because it so much relates and so much helps us to understand and be ministered to by the Holy Spirit <clears throat> so first of all authorship <clears throat> the author is extremely important and the author of this particular gospel as every author in the Bible and this is fundamental and it's not something that any of us really grapple with or worry about I don't think we have any issues with it but the author is always a double author there is always the divine and human authors involved in every book of the Bible there is no such thing as a book of the Bible not having been written by or inspired by God himself. So first of all, it's a divine human authorship. First of all, God is the divine author. He is the originator. As with all scripture, the author is the Holy Spirit. Listen to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Again, this is an important text to know, to know what it says concerning authorship of the word of God. All scripture, I'm sorry, how many did he say? All. all scripture. Now when it says all scripture, this is talking about the canon. How many books in the entire Bible? 66. How many? 66. How many in Old Testament? 39. And how many in the New? 27. All of those books, all of the received text, if you would, the canon that we have in our Bible, all of this, is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training what? And what? Righteousness. For training in righteousness. So that the man or the person, the man of God may be competent, equipped, 
for every good work. So you see, the Bible is the basic revelation of God that he has given us. And we have to know this book. But it all comes from him. So this is the most fundamental truth that we can know about the Bible. The Bible is God's book. And it is written to us, his people. And in this book, I've just listed six things that came to my mind by the Spirit. There may be more. If there are, you can add to them or whatever. But there are at least six things that God, or six truths that God is giving us in his word. And every time we open the word of God, we should be actively looking for and aware of these six. First of all, and preeminently, this book is a revelation of God himself. We do not read the Bible preeminently and primarily for something for us. Otherwise, we even make the word of God an idol because it becomes for us. The book is about, from, and for God primarily. So if you need to get something for you, if you have a question, if you have a need, if something is going on and you need to go to your Bible, go to it. But go to it with this. The answer to my need is God himself. Amen? Amen. It's not in this particular scripture. Oh, oh, thank you. Paul, thank you. Man, that was great. That's good. That's right. But why is that scripture so important? Why was it so relevant? Why was it so meaningful to me? Why did it hit me in the face? Why? Because it said something about God. God spoke to my heart, to my need about himself. And that is what I'm getting. That is what is happening in us as we read the God, Word of God. Amen? So can we remember this? Go to the Word of God for anything and everything you want. But go to it remembering. It's a revelation of God. And as I know Jesus through this Word, everything else then will be shown to me. Everything else will be given to me. Because I'm going to the author and I'm receiving from the author about himself. Amen. This is what the word, this is preeminent. Second, what is his purpose? Well, where is God's purpose? Stay? I, I know I always do this. I, I start thinking I'm never going to get, I'm going to get through this in 10 minutes and I can't even get past the first page. Where is God's purpose statement? What is God's purpose to you? Why are you here? What are you supposed to be doing? Where are you supposed to be living? How are you supposed to be? What, what are you supposed, who's your spouse? You know, you know, what, what, where are the answers to all this stuff about my life? Where are they, Steve? In one verse. Did I put you on the spot? I didn't mean to. I did mean to, but I... Where is the answer for every question about my life? In one verse of the Bible. I have said it 10,826 times. Now come on. No, no, this says something. Come on. Let's get this in our hearts. Genesis what? 1, 26. You want to know what God is all about? Kirk, you want to know what's going on with God in your life? Genesis 1, 26. Everything about my life. Everything. Lester, how much? Everything. Everything about you and your life, your wife, your children, you know, your work, your future, your past, your present. Everything where is contained in that one verse. God shows our natural condition. Ephesians 2.1. What does it say in Ephesians 2.1? You see, I didn't put these verses down here purposely. This is for you to do. What is our natural condition? How do I know my natural condition? I'm just giving you one. One of the natural, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. We were all what? Dead. Almost dead. We were just kind of slumbering. We, we just, we were what? Dead. In our what? Sin. Trespasses and sins. But you do see what it says. Good God. We were. Do you see that? He's talking to the church. So what does it say, Nettie? We what? Were. were. We were. That's our natural condition. Dead. Romans 6, 8, and 10. He gives you four words. I won't tell you what they are. Four words, Romans 6, 8, and 10. That is another descriptive. Romans 3, 
10 through 18. It's another set. You want to know who you are in the natural? Read some of these verses. And then you let them sink in. And then you will begin to understand the doctrines of grace. You see, one of our problems is when we have struggles with these things, <clears throat> we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to sink into us his word to really root it deeply into our hearts and minds. It's kind of a peripheral thing. And so we dig down about an inch and we, we get confused. We don't know where we're going because it's not deep. And so a wind of doctrine, a wind of issue, a wind of something blows against it and down falls our tree. Why? Because the roots ain't deep. Read these verses. And when you do, then you will begin to understand why Ephesians 2, 4 is so spectacular. Oh, I, I don't remember what 2.4 says, so don't tell me about it. The remedy is Ephesians 2.4. I skipped, didn't I? The remedy. The remedy, Ephesians 2.4. I know there are many others. 1 John 1.7, Colossians 2.13. I mean, come on, come on. We ought to have all these things coming off our tongue. Boom, 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 boom. It's the word of God of life. I may have to continue with this next week. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I'm not sorry. Our hope of new life in Christ. Where is our hope? In whom? Why is it in whom? And why can we be secured in him? First Peter tells you that. About this hope that is kept somewhere. Being protected by somebody. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 all the way through 18 and maybe into 19 and 20. Get these verses into us. <laughs> this is more important than if LSU beats Alabama next week. Whoa! But let's be as more excited about the contest of God against Satan. Amen? Amen? We're in the biggest football game in all the world. And we win. I mean, come next Saturday afternoon. Don't you call my house. Gene ain't going to answer. Am I right about that or not, girl? Probably. 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 Gorilla glue is not more sticky than... <laughs> she is waiting to see Fournette run those runs. Vroom, 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 vroom. Isn't that right? And it's okay to enjoy sports. And then at least six, our eternal future with him in the new heaven and the new earth. Ah, oh, where is the description of this new heaven and earth? Where do I go in the Bible to find it? Revelation. Where in Revelation? 21 and 22. Get the word. I thought I was going to just skip through these. So, this is the book of God. The book of God. This book. I, I just, I, I must, I'm sorry to take, to do this. No, I'm not sorry. I'm going to do it. Stop being foolish, man. I met with a couple the other day. And if any of you have ever met with me more than once, I tell you to bring three things with you. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. What do I tell you? Anybody been in here? My office? I know several of you have. Bring what three things? Bible, book, and a pen. Uh, or a notebook and a pen. Bible, notebook, and a pen. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to start saying stuff. And if you're like I am, you're not going to remember 99% of them you get out. Oh yeah, that's good. Thank you, Lord. I learned something. And go out. Huh? Taking notes. Notes. And so this electronic stuff is okay for <laughs> quick reading. Don't let the devil trick you into thinking that that's the way to learn the word of God. Amen. Open your Bible. Take out a pen. Get a companion book to walk with you through it. There's a wonderful series of New Testament commentaries. Small books. Let's read Matthew. Let's read Mark. Let's whatever. And these men go through the material. There are other good, good companion books to go 
to use to get the information and start reading those, read the text, ask God to give you revelation, begin to think, use those and begin to, oh, that's what that means. Oh, I didn't see, oh, I didn't see how that, and begin to take notes in your Bible, right in the Bible. It is a textbook, for goodness sakes. Buy a Bible that gives you the ability to write between the verses and into verses and the next for the verses. And if you don't have one that does that, put it aside and get one that gives you that ability. Learn, study, read the Bible. The weakness is, oh, I read four chapters yesterday. Well, I'm glad for you. But did you take time to sit down and meditate and begin to ruminate and, 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 and masticate, you know, read and eat and swallow Kate this word? <laughs> Get it in us. Get it in you. How many of you know, just raise your hand if you do, and can repeat it, because if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to repeat. Second Corinthians 5.21. Give us a hint. Give us a hint. What about at least this one? Second Corinthians 5.17. Whew. You know. Wow. I mean, one of these big verses that we quote all the time. But if I ask a man, who's the quarterback for? No, no, no. We laugh, and it's okay to know the quarterback, but it's not okay to know the significant parts of the Word of God. Amen. And you're here for that purpose. But I want to encourage us to do better. To do better. Because there's an enemy out there who is prowling about. Where does that come from? First Peter 5. Eight. Seeking whom he may, and he will devour you and your children and your spouses spiritually if we don't know how to protect ourselves with the sword of the Spirit, which is where is that? That's in Ephesians. Ephesians 6, verse. Ah, 16. <laughs> the reason I know all this is I have it all written on my hand right here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, wait, wait, wait. There it is. <laughs> know your word. Let's, let's know. Let's be people, really people of the word of God. You'll be surprised how the Lord will anoint you and use you in a much greater way. Amen. Well, that's just the first thing. We have 22 more. <laughs> <clears throat> I hope the preacher who's preaching this morning won't mind if we miss his preaching. <laughs> Secondly, Matthew is the human author. It, it, it's just, it, it, it's a human author. God, St. Peter 1, you see 2021, God used human, human authors to speak. And he is ascribed to be the human author by some of the early writers, um, some of the early Christian leaders. I have Irenaeus, Eusebius, Jerome, Augustine here. Just some of these men. They ascribe the authorship to Matthew. Uh, I don't think that's so significant, significant that it throws everything down. Someone wrote it. A man of God wrote it. Anointed by the Holy Spirit. We believe it was Matthew. It could have been one of the other apostles. But at any rate, we think it's Matthew. So this means this. That everything in this letter, I'm sorry, everything in this gospel, as in every word of the word of God, and we have to see this, everything is God speaking to me and you directly and personally. Do you get that? Even in the Old Testament, when there's some of this weird stuff, and how can that apply to me or whatever, I hated that. It has something to do with God's communicating something of himself and something about me to me. Amen? Yes, amen. Do we get that? Everything. There's not a thing in the Bible that is insignificant to me. Why? Because it is the revelation of God himself to me. Amen. So we don't raise and lower and all that. We just take it as a great revelation from God. <clears throat> it's a theological biography. You see, Matthew's, as each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are theological biographies. They're not biographies in the typical sense. You start off when the person was born, you go for the first month, second year, third year, high school, college, whatever. It's a linear thing. You know, once in a while we may talk about something in the past. It's a theological biography. That means this. It is a spiritual theological biography whose that whose reveals which reveals the spiritual truth about the person and work of Jesus God's Messiah promised 
It's a spiritual theological biography. Therefore, the Gospel of Matthew is more of a theological picture of the life of ministry of Jesus than a strict linear history. What does that mean? It means this. <coughs> that when you look at the, the things that Jesus does, where he goes, and what he says, you're going, to see, you're going to see an arrangement that is in some way similar to Matthew, I mean Mark and Luke, the synoptics. That is going to be different than John. But then you're going to see things in Luke that Jesus says, says something here, 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 and over here. And so distributed among five or six chapters of various sayings and teachings. Huh, okay. Then in Matthew, you see them all crammed into one place. Well, wait a minute, something, no. What these men are doing by the leading of the Holy Spirit, God has an aspect of the person and work of Christ that he is emphasizing in each of the Gospels. Each one of them tells us something unique, not, well, something specific that is emphasized in one is in the others, but not emphasized as much as something else in the others. Amen? Do we get that? Okay. And so he's building a picture of Jesus that he's trying, sorry, that he's wanting, that he emphasizes in this particular gospel. And we'll see what that is. Mark is being used to emphasize something else, particularly about Jesus, although the other elements are there. Luke and John. And so the Lord gives to Matthew a way of constructing it. Put this here. Here's five sermons that Jesus preached in Luke. Let's put them all together in the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, okay. Is that wrong? No, because this is the way that often biographies are done in those days, in that period of time, in that place. It was a typical way of doing biographies. We don't like it because we think we have learned that a biography to be really true and exact or whatever has to be linear. That's just the way we do it culturally. There are other ways of doing it. Amen? Amen. And so you'll see people struggling. Well, wait a minute. This is here, but in John it's not here. Or it's here. Do we see what we're doing here? It's the same revelation. Some content in one gospel is there, not in another one. And this, it's the same revelation, but God is putting it together to give us a theological or spiritual statement that he wants us to, what he, that he emphasizes to us in this particular gospel. Do we get that? Kind of important when you read, when you put, what do you call that? When you have the gospels all together and you read the various ways. Uh, sorry, somebody said it loud, I can't. The harmony of the Gospels. And you see that. So Matthew's here and you see it all spread out all over here. And John over here. And, it, you know, and we'll learn something about that history when we get into the Gospel of Matthew itself. The audience. Matthew's writing primarily to Jewish countrymen. To Jewish countrymen. To show or prove that through his use of the Old Testament Scriptures. To fulfill, to fulfill, to fulfill which you'll see. He uses the Old Testament Scriptures as he records the person, the life, the ministry, the works, the teachings of Jesus. And he constantly says this is to show that Jesus is the promised the promise one. <clears throat> and this is what Matthew was emphasizing. That Jesus is God's promised Messiah King. You notice I put it like that. Messiah King. He's doing that double thing. The problem with the Jews is that Jesus wasn't just the Messiah, wasn't just the king, but that Jesus claimed himself to be God as Messiah King. I mean, I think they would have had a problem with him just being Messiah King. That's bad enough. But now you have introduced the element of deity in this, and this is what they were rebelling about mostly. But Matthew shows that through the life of Jesus, you see what he's doing here? You see what he said there? How, you know, that was prophesied a thousand years before. Here it is. 800 years before. Here it is. 600 years before. Here it is. And he's constantly connecting. What does that say to us? Anytime and every time we read the Bible, let the Bible interpret itself. It always will. It always will. We don't need proof in the secular that there was an ark. Well, it would be nice if they found the ark, right, Frank? That would be nice. I don't need that. I don't need a proof that did they find this or that. Oh, did you know they found... Oh, I don't need all that. It's nice. I have the revealed word of God. I have a sure proof, the word of God. And all of it is based on and affirmed by one event in history. What is that event? One event in history makes it all come together as true. What is it? The resurrection. One event brings it all together. <clears throat> the message. 
the central message of Matthew is the gospel of the kingdom of God. And in this regard, we see Matthew immediately and continually connecting the person and ministry to the kingdom of God and the coming of the kingdom of God. And what we see in the very beginning in the genealogy, in the very first verse of Matthew, and you won't see this unless you go and get a commentary to tell you what the Greek is. In the very beginning, Matthew was showing this is the coming of the kingdom of God and he connects that revelation with Genesis. With Genesis. What? With Genesis. What Matthew does, just to sneak a little bit for next week if we get there, is in the first 17 verses, he says this, what I'm going to be presenting and what's happening here is that which began in Genesis went through the Old Testament, so I'll collapse the history of the Old Testament into 17 verses, and here we are. Matthew gives us the whole Old Testament, 17 verses essentially. This is, it began then, it, Adam forfeited, God began to move, rest, move to restore through these 17 verses that I'm recording to you, and here we are. This is the beginning of the fulfillment of what God started in Genesis. You remember I've told you this before, you cannot and will never understand the Bible in its full richness unless you get Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Amen. You have to see everything this way. And so if we've not read the Bible, and, and all, actually all four of the Gospel writers go back to Genesis in some way. They all say, hey, they grab Genesis, and they grab the Kingdom of God, and there's a little bit in between that shows about the Old Testament, sometimes there's a reference, sometimes, and we start. This is Genesis 1 and 2 being fulfilled. This is the second Adam. Where does God say second Adam? 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Remember, the second Adam. Maybe 44, but I think it's 45. <clears throat> we see that Matthew understands that the life and ministry of Jesus is the fulfillment of God's original purpose in Adam. Here we have beginning in the pages of Matthew, Genesis 1, 26, being made applicable and fulfilled in this one man. Let us make man in our image. So he is the exact image of God. Hebrews 1 3. The exact image of God who comes upon the earth. Here he is. The Adam who failed is now here in Jesus Christ who will not fail. So what God began and purposed in Genesis and explained in Genesis 1, especially in Genesis 2, he is now where? Here in the first pages of Matthew. That's what we're seeing here. That's, it, I, I think this is wonderful. I think it's exciting to see the Word of God in a larger way like this. He is here. He is here to take dominion. In Matthew, remember, he is emphasized as God's Messiah, ruling king. Adam was to be God's what? Agent of rule. Remember Genesis 2, 28? Take dominion, rule. Remember that? Pneumonia, dominion and rule. Rule, rule, dominion. And so what does Jesus do? He begins to come and be shown as the ruler, the dominion taker. The establisher, if you would, the king of God's kingdom. He is doing what God gave to Adam to do in Genesis 1.28. We see it in the person and ministry of Jesus. Here he is. He's doing and fulfilling God's purpose to him as given to him and explained in Genesis 1.28. Here he is. The kingdom begins. The rule of God, that which God wanted for Adam, is now being completed in Christ. Matthew presents Jesus as a second Adam, Israel's true king, by setting forth the five qualifications, five essential qualifications, one of which, if left out, he is not the Messiah. That had to be true of Jesus to be God's Messiah. First, he's the son of God. I have a few references there. He's the son of man. He's the son of David. What is the th fourth one? He is the what? suffering son or servant and fifth what is required what is what did I say the what risen ruling reigning king those five have to be in place all five of them 
together, comprehensively, simultaneously, all five of them. So what are they? He has to be who first? The Son of God. Secondly, you see, the Son of God bringing God to man. Son of man bringing man to God. God and man joined together, Emmanuel, in this one man. Third, who is he? He is a son of David. He comes through a particular tribe. The scepter shall not leave uh, Judah until Shiloh comes, until he whose right it is to handle the rule. The, the son of David, root of Jesse, remember in Isaiah 11, 1. And then who else is he? He's also in Isaiah 53, the what? suffering son or the suffering servant. And then he is a triumphant king, the ruling, reigning, returning Christ. That's who he is. All five of those have to be in place. Remember this, Christians. It's important for us to know these basics because if we don't and we don't hold on to them, the devil is going to shake us. Yeah. He's going to shake you. He's going to shake you. The structure. Well, there's several ways of doing the structure and I'm going to let you look at this, but here's how I'm going to do the structure. A, B, C. You see it is here? There's several ways of outlining the structure of Adam, uh, Matthew. Here's how I felt the Lord give it to me. The announcement of God's Messiah, chapters 1 and 2. The presentation of the Messiah, remember John the Baptist, chapter 3. The confrontation, remember, in the wilderness, chapter 4. The proclamation of the Messiah, all that Jesus does and says and so on. The uh, emul emul immolation of the Messiah. What does that mean? What does immolation mean? I said, Lord, I know there's another I-O-N word. I can't get it. And then immolation came to my mind. Isn't that amazing? Isn't God good? You know what immolation means. It means the what? The burning up, the suffering, the destruction at the cross. And then what? The vindication. The vindication. This is my son. And I'm proving it to you in the resurrection. Amen? So that's how I'm doing it. Jesus' titles, you can see that. Uh, again, the unique material that is in Matthew uh, that might be important to you. And then just some things about next week's verses, okay? Huh. Well, let's get going with this. Read ahead of time before you come in here. Ask people to come into the class. It's not important because Bill teaches or Evan teaches or Peter teaches. It's important. Why? Because what? It's the word of life. Let us evangelize within the church and say, please come with me next week. Please come with me next week. Amen? Amen. See you next week. Be praying for the sermon.